History Podcast. Today we're speaking with Kent Powell, who is a distinguished historian of Utah and the author of an article in the winter 2016 issue of Utah Historical Quarterly entitled Utah's War Machine. So, hello. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Kent, you are the editor of a forthcoming book called Utah and the Great War about the subject and the title. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Utah's World War I experience? Just a little. <laughs> well, the Utah experience was really part of the national experience in many ways, but it was also a unique local experience as well, in that it uh, really, in my mind, marks a change of, uh, of Utah history from the period of uh, fighting for statehood and, mm -hmm. and all of the controversies of the 19th century and now entering the 20th century and, and becoming a part of the United States. And, uh, uh, and one of the things that, uh, as far as the Utah experience goes, is that uh, it really demonstrated that Utah now was a part of the United States, part of the mainstream, that it, uh, uh, it was patriotic, it was doing what it could to contribute to the war, uh, that it was being recognized for those kinds of things. So, as I say, it marks kind of a turning point as far as Utah history is concerned. We see during that time then the federal government becoming much more involved in Utah in the sense of uh, a positive way. Maybe it had been more negative during the fight for statehood and, and so forth, but now we see these partnerships between uh, the federal government, the state government, uh, the LDS Church, also uh, uh, other organizations. And so even a coming together of Utahns, both Mormon and non-Mormon, for a, a cause. What made, what was different in Utah than elsewhere? In, I mean, the, the, the experience of this state during the First World War. So I guess that coming into the mainstream, or, or was, was it similar? Uh, yes, and in fact, uh, as com commentators came to Utah, outsiders came in and commented on, on what was happening in Utah. <clears throat> that was one of the things that uh, they commented on, was just how uh, Utah was demonstrating its patriotism, uh, recognizing that outside the state, many people had said that uh, uh, the West in particular Utah specifically were not really that patriotic compared with other parts of the state. Uh, but as these people came in from the uh, um, Council of Defense, the National Council of Defense and, uh, and other organizations, uh, they left giving those very positive comments that, uh, that Utah was in fact in the mainstream and its patriot patriotism was not to be questioned. Uh, uh, anymore, and it certainly ranked with any other place in the country. So that's the main subject of your article, is the Council of Defense. Can you tell us what that was? What the whole, just about the system generally? Uh-huh. Well, um, the Utah Council of Defense was part of a national organization in the sense that um, there was a, a national council made up of six of the cabinet members, including the Secretary of uh, the Interior and Labor and, and these kinds of groups. And then the idea was for each state to have its own state council of defense. And then in each state under that, there would be county councils of defense and even uh, community councils of defense. So have, you have this I think very elaborate structure of how do we maximize civilians and get them involved in the war effort. And so that's, that was the subject of the, uh, the article, what the uh, Council of Defense looked like here in Utah, who some of the key players were, how it worked with these 28 uh, uh, county councils. There were 28 established, only Daggett County was the only county that uh, it did not have a county council of defense, and um, there weren't very many people in Daggett they County They can be at that excused, time. yeah. <laughs> and they were all living on ranches anyway, but yeah. uh, 
Um, so the idea was to have a structure that could mobilize the resources of the state of the community, that could focus in on what needed to be done in terms of uh, fundraising, in terms of educating, um, and conserving uh, food and other uh, uh, scarce items. Uh, and I think part of it was to make people feel that they were making a contribution to the war effort, that this wasn't just something that uh, the boys who were sent off to fight did, but that everyone had a responsibility. And one of the uh, interesting things for me to learn was that uh, uh, during the war, Utah raised or contributed $81 million to the war oh, wow. effort through uh, uh, liberty loans and buying war stamps and these kinds of things. And with a population of 400,000 Utahns at that time, that ended up being about $190 per uh, man, woman, and child in the state. Wow. Which if we were to compare that with today, I'm not sure how that would calculate out, but it yeah. would be thousands of dollars really per person. And not only that, then about, uh, it's, it was estimated at the time, 90% of Utahns participated in this uh, fundraising effort or uh, by buying stamps or war bonds or whatever. So uh, that was amazing to me, just the uh, the way that the groups were able to mobilize and, and I'm not sure that it was always uh, patriotism that led people to buy war bonds. I think sometimes they felt that they were browbeaten and <laughs> uh, maybe even threatened if they didn't. But, uh, yeah. uh, but it was a very significant effort. Uh, the other statistic that I found very interesting was that there were uh, 21,000 Utahns who served in the armed forces during that time. Wow. And of those uh, uh, 200 and, let's see if I get my statistics right here, uh, 250 died either in combat or accidents related to that. Uh, another 400 died of disease, primarily influenza during that time. Oh, wow. And then another 850 were wounded. Hmm. So doing a little calculating uh, of those 21,000, that amounted to about 5% of the state's population were in the military service during the war. And so if we take our 3 million population today and use that 5%, we would be looking at 150,000 Utahns serving in the armed forces during that time, uh, which would be an unbelievable number in my mind anyway, to, to have that many people uh, in yeah. military service. I just read your article about the German, German population in Utah. That's uh -huh. a good one. Um, in World War One. I. I don't remember. Do you say how much, I, I know this was 20 years ago, but um, how many German, people of German ancestry enlisted? Uh, that aspect is so interesting to me. Yeah, those folks. as I recall, there were about 10,000 German Americans here, either immigrants. In Utah? Yeah, wow. during that time, uh, people who had immigrated or children of immigrants mm -hmm. who still spoke German. Um, and I'm not sure exactly of the number of Germans, but uh, the whole immigrant population, according to Helen Papa Nicholas, about 10% of the 21,000 were ethnic uh, mm -hmm. immigrants, and probably a, a good part of those were German. You know, just personally, my great-great-uncle, Bismarck Walter, um, <laughs> we have a picture of him in his World War I uniform, and he, they lived in Brigham City, and, and I've thought, boy, what were the social pressures on this fella? Uh -huh. You know, what must that have been like to yeah. be named Bismarck <laughs> in, in Brigham City during World War One? <laughs> I'll bet that was a real challenge, yeah. yeah. And that was one of the real fascinating <laughs> things about the article that yeah. you referred to, was uh, looking at the, what... Uh, what the experience was like for the for those German Americans, mm -hmm. because of course the war begins in 1914, and the United States isn't involved uh, militarily until 1917. Uh, and 
we're very fortunate in having a German language newspaper, yeah. the Salt Lake City Beobachter or the Salt Lake City Observer, that was published beginning in 1890 and continued until after the war. And it gave uh, uh, very insightful accounts as to how the German American community responded to that. And when war broke out in 1914, then uh, a big demonstration was held down the street on mm-hmm. on Third South and uh, State Street. Uh, there was a German uh, building there, and so that became kind of the focal point. And there were several thousand who came. And uh, uh, again, we're talking about August of 1914 when the war begins. Uh, who gathered and uh, sang Deutschland, Deutschland über alles, who pledged their support mm-hmm. to the fatherland. Uh, who uh, uh, made uh, contributions to the German Red Cross, and then they end the program by singing the Star Spangled Banner. Mm. Um, So they were very patriotic toward Germany. One of the uh, speeches that was made, in fact, I used uh, his comment for the title of the article, Our Cradles Were in Germany. And then if I'd continued with the rest of it, he goes on to say, and there is where our hearts are now. Is that Anton Lund? No. Uh, this was a man by the name of Mormeister. Uh-huh. But Anton Lund does talk about that same uh-huh. I, uh, idea, maybe not quite so eloquently as yeah. Mormeister did. But uh, Our cradles were in Germany. Uh-huh. And so in 1914, that's where our hearts are now. 1917 comes, and, and what happens? Well, uh, by all appearances, then, uh, the German-American community does transfer that uh, allegiance to the United States. There's no question that in their minds that uh, uh, that's who they're to support. Um, they send their sons off to, to fight. They, they purchase the Liberty Bonds. They display those in, in windows so that or make them make it known to their neighbors that they bought bonds and that they're loyal. Um, but it was a, a real challenge. And uh, uh, one of the interesting stories coming from that article was uh, an account of um, Belgian children yeah. uh, being sent to Utah and Idaho who had lost their arms, their hands, because of, by the Germans when they invaded uh, Belgium, 1914, Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, these kinds of rumors uh, are a part of all history, but certainly during World War I, that was very much the case. And so the editor of the Beobachter, he writes an article saying that uh, he's willing to give $100 to anyone who can prove that uh, these children actually came to Utah from Idaho. And the response as well, maybe we can't prove it, but it's not, uh, it's not false either. They, they did it, and Germany needs to be held accountable. Um, well, anyway, that was a, a very interesting part of the, the topic. And then you combine the story of the German Americans in Utah with the fact that a German prisoner of war camp was located at Fort Douglas, and it gives, a, I think, that is a, a an interesting and unique ex, aspect of the uh, the story. The fact that uh, Utah was one of only two states where these German prisoners of war were located, the other being in Georgia. How did that, I guess, affect the German American population here, or everyone? Was it did it just raise tensions, or? Um, well, it's a little bit <coughs> complex because yeah. the prisoners were of two groups. One group were naval prisoners of war that had been captured in ships in Guam and Hawaii and who were brought here to Fort Douglas. And the other was uh, what were identified as enemy aliens. And these were civilian Germans who were suspected of being spies and they were sent as well to Fort Douglas. And actually there was a third group. These were primarily uh, members of the industrial workers of the world and others who had protested the, the war and ended up being arrested. And, so they and weren't German, they were just wobblies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is enough. I guess. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, but the, the local German community was advised not to have contact with them, not to show sympathy. And yet, behind the scenes, they were asked to donate books for the German wow. prisoners and, and take care of things. So They were asked by the LDS Church? Is uh, that, or? Primarily the LDS Church, yeah, to, to help out, but also uh, uh, officials at Fort Douglas to, to help huh. as well. And then uh, you know, the part of that story that continues is that uh, a good number, not necessarily the naval prisoners of war, these were the others, uh, but about 20, 21 of those died at Fort Douglas during this incarceration. <clears throat> and they're buried in the Fort Douglas Cemetery. And if you go to the cemetery, the, uh, the southwest corner, uh, there's a, a huge monument erected to those uh, German prisoners of war. <laughs> <clears throat> the largest monument in the cemetery is, uh, I'm pretty sure. And that's where each November now, the German-American com community continues to have the uh, uh, German Day of Mourning. Let's see, it's, uh, I think, the third Sunday in November. And the German community and, and others gather there to commemorate the death not only of those who died during World War I, but those German prisoners of war who died during World War II and also all victims of war and aggression, uh, both huh. military and civilian. So it's a quite a moving experience and something mm -hmm. that really is tied directly back to World War I. Who sponsored the monument, do you know? It was a, a Utah German-American organization. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, there's one story in your article, the Utah's war machine, that I, I don't think I'll get the details right, but there are two men in a, a little, it's a little town in Utah, and they're both, I think, in LDS leadership positions. And one of them is like calling the other one pro -German, a pro-German sympathizer and, um, you know, making these disparaging remarks. I, to me, I thought, my goodness, the social pressure is really intense. Mm-hmm. Do you that, remember that story? That is really an interesting story because it, it does involve a, a small town in uh, central Utah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and both were members of the County Council of Defense. That's what it is. Yeah. That and one wrong. of the members was a local bishop. And <clears throat> he was being criticized because he really didn't support the war. He hadn't purchased war bonds. He hadn't uh, joined the Red Cross. Uh, and therefore he was unpatriotic. He shouldn't be a member of the council, and he was obviously pro-German because he hadn't done these things. Uh, and that's, uh, I'm sure there were those kinds of stories probably in every community, mm -hmm. but this is one at least that came from the newspapers and, uh, yeah. and I found interesting and, and worth including in the article. So maybe that's a good time to ask what, um, or tell our audience, what kind of sources you used. You did a lot of archival work <laughs> for this article uh -huh. um, for the Council of Defense research. Uh, yes, the uh, uh, Council of Defense uh, records are here in the, uh, the state archives, so I was able to use those. Um, and also one of the uh, chores for the duties of the uh, Utah Council of Defense was to write a history of World War I and uh, a professor at the University of Utah. Um, so Neff, Neff? Yes, I'm trying to remember his first name. I was asked to do that, and so he collected... Andrew. Andrew Neff, right, thanks. Andrew Love Neff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he collected a good number of records and uh, uh, started to write that history. Uh, he never finished his manuscript, is both at the University of Utah and, and here. Oh, okay. Uh, but another historian, uh, Noble Warham, picked that up and did publish the book. That uh, became a very important source uh, with a very strange title, Utah and the Great War. Uh, how does it go? The men behind the guns and the men and women behind the men behind the guns. He needed an editor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then the, the newspapers, the local newspapers, were yeah. a, a rich source of, of information. Um, 
a few oral history interviews that were, were completed and um, trying to think of, of other sources. There were reports that the Utah Council of Defense also produced yeah. that uh, proved to be a good source. Um, and the National Archives, there were records there. Mm -hmm. uh, even in uh, Connecticut, one of the reports that I used uh, was turned in by a member of the Connecticut, Connecticut Council of Defense. Huh. And so I found reference to that and was able to get that here. And that uh, gave a very insightful view of uh, of Utah, and in fact, the title for the article comes from that uh, report as he talks about uh, Utah's war machine, which he defined as the Mormon church. Can uh, you talk about that aspect of the article? Because it's pretty interesting. Uh -huh. um, well, there was always the question, uh, how would the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints support the war? Uh, and Church leaders, I think, were obviously very patriotic in their own right, but they also recognized that the, the church would be in the limelight as well, and so needed to uh, be very obvious in their contribution to the war effort. And so prominent Utahns were involved, uh, or pr prominent uh, Mormons were involved. Heber J. Grant was in charge of really the uh, raising of... Uh, the loans, the Liberty Loans, and that, that whole program. Uh, the uh, women's uh, side of the Council of Defense and also a member of the Utah Council of, De of Defense, uh, uh, Cl Clarissa Smith-Williams, was the uh, daughter of uh, uh, the church leader, Joseph F. Smith. Um, but uh, other demonstrations then, uh, uh, rallies were held in the Salt Lake Tabernacle as well as other <coughs> churches and tabernacles throughout the state uh, but certainly there uh, local wards uh, recruited the Relief Society and children's uh, programs to uh, to help uh, uh, well identify places for uh, victory gardens and uh, teach people how to conserve the food that uh, uh, was available, how to go about having meatless weeks and so forth. Um, so the LDS Church was very prominent in that regard, uh, in leadership and in making uh, facilities available and making the organization a part of the war effort. And I think that was the part he was referring to. Well, probably all three, the leadership, the infrastructure that was used, as well as the the organization to, uh, to further the war effort. And in his history of the, the church, uh, uh, Brigham H. Roberts, uh, who, by the way, served as a chaplain in the National yeah. Guard during the war, uh, makes that very direct comment that uh, Utah Mormons in particular would be judged on how they supported the war mm -hmm. and how well Mormons worked with non-Mormons in the state as well. So I think, uh, uh, by and large, the, the church uh, accomplished what it wanted to do, demonstrated huh. its patriotism, and, and aided the war effort in significant ways. That's pretty interesting. You, you, you make a point, though, that it wasn't just Mormons, right? I mean, obviously right. Bamberger was really important, Simon Bamberger. And, and I remember one of your footnotes, this list of women's organizations Mm -hmm. um, that were called upon or were part of things. I, I don't remember exactly what, but it was a really long list. It was, Just a yeah. broad smattering of, of uh, women's groups. Yeah, and I uh, put that in and wondered if you would take it out because <laughs> it was so long. And then I thought, well, I'll bet Holly will leave that in. <laughs> yeah, as if it's <laughs> women's history, I'll leave but it in. But these women groups were all different kinds. They were... Uh, 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 Job's Daughters, I yeah. believe, and, uh, and women's groups from all of the churches, both Catholic and Protestant, uh, literary groups, uh, yeah. and, uh, uh, and so that, uh, that was very much a part of the, uh, the effort to bring everyone in, let mm -hmm. everyone make a, a contribution, 
not to exclude anyone, even uh, the German American community or other ethnic groups. That was a part of the uh, the effort was to see that everyone uh, made a contribution. Everyone enhanced their patriotism and uh, and their service to the country. You know, one thing I found really interesting about your article um, was how the Council of Defense, part of this wartime expansion of of, of government, and um, you know, there's this one comment about, I mean, it's just the everyday life stuff. I mean, we all know that, but the, um, you know, telling women to use less ice for lemonade and ice water mm -hmm. or to be careful in conserving things. And that, that's a big theme in World War One, isn't it? The expansion of the federal government and that just becoming more and more part of the landscape in America. And I thought this article was really interesting for that reason that you see on, on just this day-to-day -day level can we build the Pantages Theater can this fellow build a house in Davis County you know more and more government involvement it really it, was and uh, for better or worse I suppose. Uh, and I think what the federal government did was what I guess many politicians advocate today was to delegate that down to the states so that the the states were making the decisions. Uh -huh. uh, in other words, the federal government didn't come in heavy-handed, but they said, you know, we have a common objective here. Let's figure out how we can best uh, conserve uh -huh. what resources we have. Uh, should we be building buildings, theaters in particular, or whatever? Uh, when the resources are scarce, we need to, uh, to build all of these things, put all of this into the war effort. Um, and so those ideas and directions came down from the federal government to the state government, who in turn passed it down uh, to the county councils to make mm -hmm. a recommendation that they would uh, deal with. So uh, uh, on one hand, you see then the federal government becoming more and more involved, but not in a heavy-handed way. Uh, that people felt that they were being oppressed and, uh, and dictated to. Um, and so obviously it makes an interesting com contrast with, with today where uh, the intention, I think, of the in many ways the federal government is to, to serve the people, but many people respond and feel that they're being uh, oppressed and taken mm -hmm. advantage of. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you mentioned the legacy or one aspect of uh, Council of Defense's legacy in Utah history. And, um, you know, I want to continue this line of questioning in the sense that there was a broad-based organization and there are ties between county organizations, county councils, and the state council and federal council. To what extent did those, did that network remain in place after the war? Was there any kind of lasting implication or lasting um, operation as it pertains to that wartime organization? There was a push to continue that kind of organization, that structure, uh, with both uh, state and county uh, councils, mm -hmm. with the idea being that now that the war's won, there's going to be uh, all of these other problems to deal with. Uh, veterans returning without jobs, uh, uh, dealing with uh, construction that had been delayed, uh, and how do we uh, uh, take care of farmers when uh, they've been encouraged to grow and now there's not uh, the demand that, uh, that there, there was during the war. Uh, at some point, and I, and I can't say where, but certainly at the national level, the decision was made, no, we're going to end these councils. Mm -hmm. We're going to close them down in 1919. And that was the impact here in Utah, so that uh, there wasn't a lasting legacy. Uh, but I think there was kind of a, a dormant, a, a sleeping kind of legacy that if we have to gear up again, we know mm -hmm. how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, and it seems like some of the functions of the council did uh, may have carried over later into the 
you know, operations of the federal government, and maybe the state governments, uh, into the, the Great Depression and beyond. Yeah, I think uh, I think they very much did. In, uh, uh, for example, the Council of Defense was involved in uh, uh, promoting uh, recreation for uh, for children during this time, and uh, 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 I think you can see uh, some very definite parallels during the New Deal period with with those kinds of programs. Uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, charges, one of the things that the uh, uh, Council of Defense during the war tried to do was to uh, uh, take all of the unemployed, uh, oh, right. the homeless, the hobos, the tramps, or, uh, and put them to work. Hmm. Uh, and they developed a program, passed resolutions to do that, and then they talked with the police, at least here in Salt Lake, and they said, well, uh, that's a probably a good idea, but uh, we now see, because of the war, 85% less uh, homeless and tramps, and the 15% that are still here are men that you wouldn't want working on your farms anyway. So, uh, uh, But obviously then, during the, the Great Depression, uh, with the WPA and so forth, there's that idea of, of getting people to work for their good, as well as to make a contribution to the community. Mm -hmm. Well, and I guess backwards from that, did did progressives use the Council of Defense and, and those other mechanisms to kind of get their ideas implemented? I, you're talking about the recreation. That uh -huh. sounds kind of classic. Uh, well, they did, and one that comes to mind is uh, prohibition. And oh. the, uh, the women's element of the Council of Defense pushing oh, for uh, the council to persuade the governor, Governor Van Berger, to... <laughs> contact uh, President Wilson, and, and this was not only in Utah, but other states, and insist that a nationwide prohibition be instituted as a means to, uh, uh, not only for uh, pro prohibiting the consumption of alcohol, but putting those 600,000 men to work that were producing the beer and so uh -huh. forth, and, uh, <coughs> and do that. Uh, um, but that would be, you know, uh, one example. I think in terms of of uh, this idea of what should we cons what should we be building is part of that progressive idea. We just don't let uh, businessmen go out and build whatever they want just because they have the money and the resources. But with, it, there needs to be some kind of planning that goes into this and and decide what the greater good is, the theater or or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so I think. Uh, that mentality was part of the Council of Defense. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I guess wrapping up on the the World War One aspect. So we're, you know, this is timed um, uh -huh. with the the years of the centennial. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, of the First World War? This is a, a big question. What lessons do you see in World War One? For, for modern day Utah and modern day America? That's a big question. <laughs> so. Well, and I hope that's something that uh, will be addressed uh, as part of the centennial. In fact, uh, I understand there's a push on to have a, uh, a World War I Centennial Commemoration Committee established uh, uh, through the legislature that would address those kinds of things. Um, but uh, I think, for me, some of the lessons are uh, the ability of uh, a nation, a state, to focus in on one specific objective and accomplish that, in this case, uh, the war. Uh, the other and part of that lesson is that uh, it takes a united effort. It can't just be one segment of society uh, or one class, but it needs to be uh, all groups coming together to work for that common goods. And whether you agree that uh, uh, war is good or necessary or bad, at least that was the, the lesson I think uh, during World War I is that uh, uh, people's attention could be focused primarily for the good, though there are a number of examples where maybe that was overstepped uh, 
people become a little too zealous in their, yeah. their pushing for that. Um, I think in general, uh, we need to understand World War I because uh, uh, it shows how a, a very uh, localized event in the Balkans can spread and become a, a national war and therefore uh, as citizens of the nation and of the world we need to understand our history better. Uh, we can't just ignore it but we need to uh, uh, understand what's going on. Uh, we really need to understand the Middle East for example. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't just write it off and say it's too complex, the history is uh, uh, too involved and, and goes back over centuries that we we really can't make sense of it. But I think uh, World War One shows us that it's our obligation to do that, to, to come to understand it, that we really do need history to, uh, to guide us in the future. That's wonderful. We wanted to change gears completely okay. and, and ask you, you were at the Historical Society for about 43 years. I think mm -hmm. you started really young and we're here just four decades. Um, lucky Historical Society, uh -huh. uh, honestly, lucky. Um, so what are, what are some of the highlights of those 40 years? Well, I started uh, in 1969 while I was still an undergraduate at the University uh -huh. of Utah. Uh, that was when I first <clears throat> heard about the Historical Society and yeah. uh, I remember driving by the Kearns Mansion and which was the home of the Historical Society then and thinking, well, you know, what a great thing to have a, uh, an institution that's devoted to, to state history. So uh, when I was able to begin working there part-time, that, uh, that was a very special uh, job for me, more than a job. It really did launch me into a career in history and, uh, uh, and being able to stay with the Historical Society during that time. Uh, one of the uh, uh, programs that was just getting started as I started was the Historic Preservation Program. Huh. And that was the opportunity for me to move into a, uh, a full-time position here at the Historical Society. Uh, so that was certainly a highlight to be involved pretty much from the, the ground up with the establishment of the, the State Historic that. Preservation Program. And uh, in my mind, it has become uh, one of the, the best programs in the, the entire nation. Uh, I think our move from the Kearns Mansion, temporary quarters in the Crane Building, and then here to the Denver and Rio Grande Depot in uh, 1980, you know, has to be a highlight that uh, uh, this building has served uh, the Historical Society now for what, 36 years, yeah. um, been a great home, a great symbol for, for history. Uh, I guess the other highlight, if, if I narrow it down, would be the Utah Historical Quarterly. Uh, to see that uh, continue as a, uh, an outstanding history publication, again in my mind, one of the best state historical journals in the entire nation. Uh, to look back and see the contributions that people have made to that and how it really is a, uh, uh, a history of the state. Yeah. And getting back to World War I for just a minute, the, yeah. the book that we'll be publishing with the University of Utah Press as part of this centennial celebration, uh, Utah and the Great War, the Beehive State and the World War I experience, uh, of the 17 articles that are included in that volume, 16 of them come from articles published yeah. in the Utah Historical Quarterly. Uh, so seeing the, the quarterly published continue as a very viable and, uh, and the future of the quarterly looking uh, very prosperous and promising, uh, that has to be a highlight as well. And finally, I guess I should say the, the great people I've been able to work with yeah. here at the Historical <laughs> Society, and I, I won't name any names because then I will leave someone out, but uh, uh, the state has been very fortunate to have dedicated uh, public servants who are committed to history, who have uh, been willing to uh, uh, 
take on the challenges of, uh, of, of state history and I think have served the, the state very well. Now, since you mentioned the Utah Historical Quarterly, uh, when you came on board as an undergraduate working, did you say part-time? Yes. In 1969, uh -huh. did you, 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 you began your work in the Historic Preservation Office. Um, at the same time, you're getting a degree in history uh, and eventually a PhD in history from the University of Utah, mm -hmm. is that correct? Um, what involvement did you have with the quarterly early on in your career at the Historical Society? <laughs> at that time, Stan Layton, I guess, would have been the new editor. Uh, was, he, was, was there so someone Leonard there before? Yeah, when I, I started. Glenn Leonard. Yeah. Glenn Leonard uh -huh. <coughs> yeah. And when I started in 1969, uh, there were two Centennial publications then, the uh, Golden Spike oh, Centennial. Right and the John Wesley Powell yeah. Expedition mm -hmm. Centennial. Mm -hmm. And I think those had a great influence on me to see how uh, the quarterly and, and other books could be used to, uh, to highlight centennials, to commemorate them, to, uh, to educate uh, Utahns in that yeah. direction. And I suppose, again, the World War I book is, is part of that. Yeah. Um, but uh, going back, the first article that I published in the quarterly was two or three years after I began working here, mm -hmm. uh, which was on the Schofield Mine Disaster. Yeah. And that was a, uh, I don't know if I should make this comparison, Holly, but it's uh, something like having your first child uh -huh. to publish your first article in the quarterly. <laughs> uh, well, almost. <laughs> uh, and I think that was something else that uh, I think the quarterly has been very effective in doing mm -hmm. that is encouraging first time publishers to have a, an outlet for their work. Yeah. Uh, and not only first time, but to the people that have published a great deal, feeling that this is the kind of journal that we want to, to publish our material in. So I think the balance of the, the historical quarterly is something that uh, uh, I've appreciated very much. and. Mm -hmm. And I think I learned from certainly from Stan Layton and Glenn Leonard, uh, Chaz Peterson, uh, yeah. as they served as editors of the quarter. To keep a balance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful legacy, though, because it is. so many of us, I think two of us yeah. included, had some of our first publications, yeah. one of our first publications in the quarterly, yeah. as you know, very young students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is um, working with someone on a professional level, like we did, publishing that those articles, was a great experience. Um, yes. And it kind of gave us a window into mm -hmm. the scholarly world and publishing and, you know, gave me a taste and love for Utah history. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, if for no other reason, to keep the quarterly going is to give young scholars that opportunity. Mm -hmm. But uh, obviously there are many more benefits of the quarterly beyond that. But uh, um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's a great legacy of the quarterly. You know, um, a few days ago, someone came in and saw the county history series on our bookshelf, uh -huh. and they said this is one of the greatest accomplishments of the historical society. And that was, of course, you were a major part of that, or a, a guiding light. Um, uh -huh. How was that experience? It must have been hard. <laughs> it, it is a it's a huge accomplishment. Mm -hmm. That was. Well, I think it was a huge ac accomplishment just to get the funding for it. And, oh, <laughs> and, uh, the truth, yeah. And it would not have come about if it hadn't been for uh, a gentleman up in Morgan County, Joe Francis, who uh -huh. went to the legislature, secured the funding for it, and had that funding come to state history, oh. where we were able to uh, uh, provide funding for each county to hire a historian uh, to write uh, the volume and the... Um, he also secured from the legislature funding to publish the books and have those distributed to every library uh, and public wow. school in the state. Uh, wow. So I think that was a hard part. Uh, and the, the rest of it just seemed to kind of fall together. Hmm. Craig Fuller and I worked together uh, under Max Evans to uh, uh -huh. uh, administer the program, to work with the counties and in finding historians uh, uh, to do the 
editing and the arrange for page proofs yeah. and so forth. Uh, but uh, that certainly is one of uh, my or pr proud accomplishments, I yeah. think, and, and I think for the historical, the entire historical society, because it it took the support of the administration, it took uh, uh, the support of uh, the library and other people to huh. uh, uh, to help bring that about. You know, and we just received something from the the state library a few days ago about the um, digital checkouts of. Of, of their books and the the county histories are at the very top oh really and they're yeah and that i mean they're checked out at, or i don't know 20 times a year just a huge number comparative compared to what books usually are oh so uh -huh. that was really gratifying to see uh -huh. well that's 20 years ago now that uh, that oh, I guess series so, was huh? done 1997 and, uh, it may be time for uh, uh -huh. uh, the historical society to look to another project like that yeah. Do you have a sense for uh, for the impact on the scholarship and the telling of Utah history that, that that series has had, as well as the quarterly over the years since you've since you've been here? What kind of tangible impact it's maybe had on? Uh, it's something that I can't measure, but I do look at when I pick up a, a book. And go to the, the footnotes, the end notes, and, and see yeah. how often the quarterly and the county histories are used. And mm -hmm. uh, maybe I looked with a biased eye, but I <laughs> see uh, most historians using them in, uh, uh, to some extent in their writings today. Uh, and so I think that, uh, that certainly had an impact. I think. Uh, uh, in the schools, I think uh, uh, children, even my own grandchildren, have used those in huh. in writing their reports on on the counties. Uh, and another project of that time period was the uh, the Utah History Encyclopedia That's that right. we published with the University of Utah Press. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and thanks to the web, that has gotten tremendous circulation as well. Yeah. You know, there might be there might be some that would say, you know, what need is there for county local history? What what does it really contribute to the larger narrative? And what what case would you make for local history and its importance? Well, uh, I think in in two ways. Uh, for example, when I travel or go to a community for any length of time. That's the first thing that I try to find is a local history so that I can become familiar with uh, with the community, with the area. Mm -hmm. uh, I would argue for people moving into Utah <coughs> that that would be something that, that they should do as well. That is, uh, uh, get familiar with the history, understand why things are the way they are today. Uh, and I would make uh, the same kind of argument for uh, uh, our children, that if they're going to be Utahns, they need to understand the past. They need to understand the community in which they live, uh, how it developed, uh, what some of the challenges have been. And so I would make that argument for community histories, for county histories, and certainly state histories, that uh, uh, if we want a richer life, uh, if we want a, a society that's grounded in uh, um, the ability to make good decisions in the future, it really has to be based on the history. Uh, and not just national history, but the local history as well, because uh, uh, you know, it's all part of history. Uh, local history to me is just as important is national history, uh, especially uh, uh, if you're going to stay in that community for any length of time. Yeah. Mm. I think that's a good place to close. You, okay, uh, well, I hope you've got something there that you can great. use. I think we do. Okay. It's really good. Uh, well, I appreciate your publishing the, the article. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good.